I introduce you. The, the next speakers tonight are uh, Brandon Olson and, uh, sorry, I find myself in the program here, and Manny Moss. Brandon is from Boston University and Manny from City University of New York. We're going to be speaking tonight on digital imaging and spatial analysis in archaeology, problems and prospects. kind of thank everybody for putting this together. Obviously, Derek, Aaron, wherever Aaron went, uh, she's gone. <laughs> well, tell her I thanked her. Uh, Jody, obviously, uh, Michael, too, uh, for putting this on. It's a great ev uh, uh, venue to be able to talk about all things digital archaeology, which we all are obviously interested in. Um, so we thank you guys for that. Uh, the title of our paper today is Dig Digital Imaging and Spatial Analysis in Archaeology, Problems and Prospects. Uh, Uh, so we this plan is specific to talk about image-based modeling using PhotoScan. Uh, something Steve just talked about. It's a great program. Most people already know that already, but we're going to give a just kind of a little bit of a background, intro on a couple of things, just to make sure everybody's on the same page. Um, and in order to do that, we're going to look at its utility, mobility, and problems resulting from its rapid evolution. In the most fundamental sense, PhotoScan uses a series of systematic to capture photographs and various algorithms to generate a host of two and a half and three D products. The most common of which include point clouds, team grids, monochromatic untextured 3D models, it's a mouthful, uh, photorealistic textured 3D models, digital elevation models, and georeferenced ortho photos. By utilizing the coded target capabilities built into PhotoScan, the entire mo model can be generated to real world coordinate systems by integrating the photography process with the collection of each coded target's GPS location. This allows for multiple models to be analyzed in the proper spatial context uh, in relation to each other. So let's look at that process. Um, uh, the example here is of a late Roman basilica excavated under the auspices of the Princeton excavations at Polo Cyprus. First, a set of digital photographs are uploaded. Then using the Align Photos option in the workflow tab, PhotoScan automatically locates each photo in relation to the photographic set and creates a sparse point cloud. Um, and then using the Align Photos option, the workflow flow tab, PhotoScan automatically locates each photo in relation to the photographic set and creates a sparse point cloud. Then using the build dense point cloud function, a denser collection of points is generated. Using the dense point cloud as its underlying structure, one can create monochromatic 3D models and, fi and finally, using the photographic data set, a fully, fully photorealistic texture is created for the monochromatic model. Following the generation of the photorealistic model, several outputs will be generated. So the uh, PhotoScan <coughs> outputs most easily integrated into GIS are not true 3D objects, but rather 2.5D objects. Both orthophotos and digital elevation models, or DEMs, are raster type files for which each cell is associated with either a color value for orthophotos or an elevation for DEMs. These can be easily loaded into a GIS and manipulated by native or custom tools within the GIS environment. Sticking with these raster objects for the moment, um, once, once they are loaded into a GIS, DEMs can be converted into triangulated irregular networks or TINs, which can then be combined to construct volumetric objects belonging to the multi-patch feature class. DEMs can also be analyzed to derive elevations or as the input for volumetric calculations such as cut and fill. Orthophotos, which we'll come back to below, can be used as reference for plan drawings or as an aid for the heads-up digitization of polygon, polyline, point features. These features can be used as database entries and their outlines later incorporated into reports and final plans and illustrations. 3D objects can be exported from PhotoScan as models or as point clouds. Models can be processed and displayed in many different programs including MeshLab, Studio Max, CAD programs, Cloud Compare, and the like. Simple models can also be converted directly into multi-patch features in ArcGIS, 
but this process does not seem to work very well, reliably for more complex shapes. Point clouds, which are lists of individual points, coordinates, and attributes, can be processed in many different ways. Cloud Compare, which is free under the new general public license, provides many tools and plugins for analyzing point clouds. It can be used to display multiple objects at once, edit point clouds to remove outlying points, close point clouds by converting them into meshed models, and to combine multiple point clouds into single <coughs> models. Some of these operations can also be performed in MeshLab, for which there is marginally better online documentation. Additionally, custom scripts can be written using the Coin3D package for C++ or the PyD package for Python to extract features such as walls, windows, and other surfaces from a point cloud programmatically. At the present, there are limited resources for making true 3D objects mobile, although MeshLab offers Android and iOS versions of its software. Uh, relatively more progress has been made with making GIS mobile, as we've talked about today, um, and it is, that, it is to that which we now turn. Um, two options present themselves for making use of orthophotos and DEMs um, produced from PhotoScan in a mobile fashion. The first is through the utilization of GIS data hosting services like Esri Arc Server. This allows for orthophotos and DEMs to be served to clients who can view these images on their mobile devices, assuming they have some sort of connectivity um, to an internet or a network. Using custom apps and prepackaged templates, clients can digitize polygon, polyline, and point features over these orthophotos directly from their mobile devices. These features are automatically incorporated into geo databases and can be linked dynamically to other database records. If a mobile uh, user is connected to a central server using something like a shared drive connection, um, has been done at a site we both worked at called Kaimaksha, um, and is outlined in their forthcoming uh, Journal of Field and Archaeology article, clients can run their own version of ArcGIS remotely um, on a distant desktop, controlling the program from their mobile device. Uh, to easily serve orthophotos to the clients that way, they can be combined into an orthophoto mosaic and loaded within an ArcGIS project to provide the reference for the heads-up digitization of features. So as with any adoption of technology, there will always be problems, and here we're seeing that now, kind of as things have slowly developed, or actually kind of fastly developed here the last couple of years. Um, and that occurs obviously at the object level, at landscape level, whether you're doing this for daily excavation or whatnot. So uh, problems relating to initial implementation, such as designing a viable workflow, software familiarity among team members, data storage, and meeting hardware specifications are greatly mitigated by preseason planning, postseason assessment, and a group of capable technology coordinators. There are, however, issues that will arise that, uh, that require foresight, as well as continued reflection and data assessment. These include data curation, versioning, quality control, and reprocessing. <laughs> While well, all of the aforementioned issues are equally important, we would like to present here one case study in an attempt to emphasize the need for reflection and a proactive approach to 3D data management. The rate at which cost-effective 3D modeling programs have proliferated over the last five years is incredible. Competition among 3D software developers has fostered an environment of rapid technological change. Since its initial recorded inception in December 2010 with version 0.7.0, .0 Agisoft has released 39 updates to PhotoScan. Some updates require simple bug fixes, while others are significant revamps that introduce new tools such as support for Python scripting, automatic ground control location, point cloud re reclassification, etc. With, on average, a new version every five weeks or so, it becomes exceedingly difficult for archaeologists to develop and keep up with these advancements and consider how new versions may affect the previously collected data. We present here one case study emphasizing how fo one photo scan development, the addition of the dense point cloud creation tool in August 2013, significantly affects any previously collected archaeological 3D data. The dense point cloud option creates a 3D point cloud comparable in density to LiDAR and terrestrial laser scanning data sets. In versions anti-dating August 2013, PhotoScan used the sparse point cloud to build geometry and texture, while current versions use the dense point cloud as a framework for further processing. The example we present here is a small excavation sounding from the site of Vigo outside of Larnaca, Cyprus. The initial recording took place in June of 2013 and reprocessed using a dense point cloud option in early February 2015 using the same photographs in the same exact settings. For a quick comparison, the sparse point cloud created in 2013 consists of 344,000 points, while the dense point cloud includes 6.6 .6 million points. So 
That's your sparse point cloud. And there's your dense. Obviously, the difference between uh, three, uh, 300,000 points and 6.6 million. The subsequent creation of the geometry from the sparse point cloud and then dense point cloud, as you can see here, show little difference upon a cursory visual inspection. But the real difference, it comes when you compare the numbers. So here's your sparse point cloud geometry and your dense. So you can't quite see a whole lot if you look kind of on some of those rocks. You see a little bit more nuance, but not a whole lot. But again, in looking at the numbers, the geometry created with the sparse point cloud consists of 182,000 faces and 91,000 vertices, while the geometry derived from the dense point cloud consists of 1.3 million faces and 661,000 vertices. The difference between the resulting photographic textures is literally night and day. So there's your photographic texture with the sparse point cloud, there's your photographic texture with the dense point cloud. So again, same photos, same processing. Prior to August 2013, dense point cloud wasn't an option, so everything was processed with the sparse point cloud. And in this instance, uh, this is what that particular setting looked like, and then you had the dense. Aesthetics aside, the difference between the two models is significant and has repercussions when extracting 2.5D derivatives such as DEMs and orthophotos, as well as exporting PLY files for 3D printing. So what does all this mean? The introduction of one new photo scan tool have serious repercussions for previously collected data. In this case, the dense point cloud option led to increased resolution. A model created with a sparse point cloud consisting of 344,000 points is not nearly as refined or nuanced as a model created with a dense point cloud of 6.6 .6 million points. The models are topographically nuanced, photographic texture, photorealistic texture is clear, and 2.5D products are more accurate. What does this singular development leave? Where does this singular development leave older data? It is, ne is it necessary to go back and reprocess 3D data collected prior to August 2013? In a nutshell, if data comparability and integration is a goal, then absolutely yes. If simple aesthetics is the goal, well, not necessarily. The case study here was intended to punctuate the need for digital archaeology practitioners to constantly check, recheck, and evaluate all software utilized in an attempt to keep valuable archaeological data sets current accurate, comparable, and accessible. In returning to one of the primary themes of this conference and how it applies to 3D modeling with PhotoScan, that is mobility, dealing with the large photographic data sets and larger 2.5 and 3D data derived from an image-based modeling approach is difficult in the field. Recent projects such as the excavation at Kamakcha in Western Turkey have made great strides towards making 3D analysis mobile whereby trench-side photographs are captured processed and curated off-site in the lab, and products such as orthophotos and DEMs are returned in a matter of hours to the field for aid in, in interpretation and planning. That said, process is being made towards mobility and 3D reporting. Secondly, the evolution of 3D processing tools now requires archaeologists to be even more reflexive in their endeavors. With respect to digital archaeology, technological change is occurring at a pace unknown to archaeology. The case study presented earlier demonstrates that one singular development, that of the dense point cloud, can have profound effects on previously collected data. It is up to the digital archaeology practitioners to be proactive and informed about their digital tools and attempt to foster a responsible adoption of technology. Hi, um, I'm Sebastian Heath. Um, just a quick um, response, uh, partially channeling uh, Adam Rabinowitz's um, contribution to the Visions of Substance volume that you and Bill just kindly gave to us all for free. Um, uh, you know, I, I agreeing with what you were saying, but but making, but adding in the the importance of of um, archiving the process by which you collected the data and archiving the image, the 390 from, from Andean sites and the ones that you have taken, uh, really protecting ourselves against um, changes in technology 
or not so much protecting ourselves against changes in technology, allowing ourselves to take advantage of new, of, of new developments in technology by making sure we're collecting the data as it's originally, at, at its earliest point, as soon as it's digitized and not relying on any of, this, of the eventual products, which is what you know, a photo scan model is. So I don't think that's a particularly radical thing to say, but just both for all the people out in the world and for people here, you know, again, that may be, that may be an ongoing theme that we can develop here, you know, making sure that one is capturing the information as soon as it's digitized and not throwing anything out, which helps deal with many of the things, the important issues that you raise in your, in your talk. Right, exactly, yeah, thanks. And the fact is that we're able to use, in this particular development anyway, the same photos, same settings, it all works great, but what happens 10 years down the line when that initial data set won't be used? I mean, we're at a dead end at that point, but of course recording and versioning and dating is important. So, hi, uh, Rachel Opitz from CAST. Um, you mentioned reflexivity, and I wanted to ask you kind of an open-ended question. How is your new set of approaches and your use of 3D modeling helping you to be more reflexive as excavators? Is that for us or Steve? I wasn't sure. Oh, okay, so, oh, sorry, say that again, please, Rachel. Um, so you're using these new technologies and you're implementing them in your excavation, and you mentioned reflexivity. And I'm wondering how you see your implementation of these technologies and your use of mobile technology in the field as helping you to be more reflexive as excavators. Right. I mean, that's one of the big questions that we've kind of been asked of us and the people that we volunteer for, whether it be PCAP or Turkey or whatever, kind of what we're doing, why we're doing it, how does that open up different avenues of thought and being able to reflect back on, our, on, on the archaeological process, obviously. Uh, with the adoption of these 3D tools, obviously it's taking back some things that you won't be doing anymore had you been sitting down looking and measuring every single rock and drawing that. So in a way, you're losing that level of reflexivity when you're sitting there doing analog drawings, which is a loss. But on the, on the other hand, bringing these digital tools into things, in a way your, your accuracy is being revamped up. You are, um, you know, the time that spent recording things is not nearly as long as it has been. Um, but as some would argue, and Bill specifically, uh, that uh, a slower approach is probably a better approach. Uh, but I mean, bottom line is, it's a new, it's, it's, it's a new approach. It's bringing in things, and with all these things, and our reflexivity side of things is really being reflexive in the initial adoption, because uh, with, with PhotoScan, it hasn't been out all that long. Um, people are loving it, it's great. Um, it creates these wonderful things, but it's, it's time now that, yeah, we know it works, we know how it works, now it's time to step back and say, all right, well, what are some of these issues that we may run into five years from now? What are these, some of these issues that we are ran into but we don't know because we didn't read whatever build 1.2.6 happened, whatever that means, um, in these, in these photo, photo scan builds. But by opening up the reflexivity, especially at the initial inception, just to make sure it goes with the workflow, with your excavation goals, with your project goals, and how that works. And then again, constantly being critical of what you're using. It's great, it's creating great products, but have to be, have to be conscious of exactly how it's working and what you're doing and what the drawbacks of it are. Is that that? Maybe? Hi, Sean Ross. Uh, I hope you guys don't get sick of hearing from me the next couple of days on responding to things about mobile application development because it's sort of been spending my life doing the last couple of years. Um, and no, I just wanted to point you towards some software you might find really useful, uh, but is a little bit obscure. It took us a lot of looking because we needed currently 2.5D and then later 3D uh, uh, offline full featured mobile GIS. And uh, I just we found a company that's been really good to uh, to work with with that. It's called Nudetech out of out of uh, Estonia, and oh, they've uh, Estonia. and and it it's it it does support um, either 2.5 or you buy the full license 3 uh, uh, 3D and and I think it th it addresses some of the shortcomings that you were talking about with the software that you're that you're using now. And they even though they're, they're a commercial company, but they've been really really good about letting us um, incorporate their code into an open source release and they, they're, they're just really great, so.
And can you say that name again? It's uh, new to tech. I, I can give you the re the, the reference That'd later. Be perfect. Yeah. And yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah that'd be, that's great. <laughs> So tw Twitter's <laughs> not my fav my flavor, unfortunately. So, uh, but I'll, uh, I'll I'll pass that I'll pass that on. Oh, and they do have uh, they have uh, uh, SDKs for iOS and Android. That's uh, great. Yeah, I mean that's a wonderful thing about coming together like this because I mean I imagine that almost every person in here kind of stumbled on PhotoScan all by themselves, and while other people were working on it and coming together like this to be able to do exactly what we just did is great.